And so while you're preparing those, and also your offerings, I wanted to talk to you about the ministry of giving thanks. You know, and, uh, as I was saying, it is Thanksgiving this week. This was a national holiday that was declared by President Lincoln back in 1863, you know, kind of right in the middle of the Civil War, which might seem a little interesting because it might seem like, well, what did they have to be thankful for? You know, in, in that one. That one was a, a really horrible conflict. I can't even imagine probably what it was like back then. Um, you know, it was brother against brother, and, you know, it, it was really our bloodiest conflict that we've ever had. Um, more, more people died, you know, in that one than in any other um, war that we've had, or at least U.S. people died. You know, but he found a way to give thanks, even in the middle of that. And it was his desire that we pay homage to God for the wonderful things he has done, and also that we invoke the influence of his Holy Spirit to subdue anger and rebellion, to change hearts, and to guide the government with wisdom. You know, so those are all great things, and as Christians, we can really get behind this holiday, I feel like. And it shouldn't just be for one day, though, right? You know, it should be all the time. And so let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. You know, so Lincoln was doing this in everything. Even in the middle of a war, he was like, we're going to give thanks. And so that's something that we should be doing. And just as an aside, I wanted to mention that if you're kind of been praying about what is God's will for your life, you know, or over something that you're kind of trying to discern what he wants you to do, Giving thanks would be a great place to start, you know, because it's clear, it's very clear here that that is God's will for us, to give thanks. And I just believe as we do that, that he'll then begin to speak to us about specific things. And recently I was reading in First Chronicles about a ministry of thanksgiving that was part of what the Levites did. So First Chronicles 23.30 says, They are to stand every morning to thank and to praise the Lord, and likewise at evening. And this was a ministry that they had to the Lord. You know, and really, as Christians, we are Levites. I know you may not have actually ever thought of yourself as that. Um, but the Bible tells us that we're priests unto the Lord. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.5. It says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And Peter was not just writing to pastors, he was writing to all Christians, that we are all called to be priests, and since the priests were from the, the tribe of Levi, that makes us Levites. And so this is very important that we engage in this ministry of giving thanks to the Lord. And especially for those of us who do a lot of um, serving, you know, here in the church we do that. Um, you know, I think for Pastor David and I, that can be a thing. You know, also, just if you're someone who gives a lot, you know, and I'm not at all saying that that's a bad thing. Um, that's a great thing. The Bible does talk about serving. But uh, just to kind of pay attention to whether you're only just getting into the doing of things. I have a quote here from Watchman Nee where he talks about this. He says, many of you are doing your utmost to help your brethren. And you are laboring to save sinners and administer the affairs of the church. You know, all really good things. But let me ask you, have you been seeking to meet the need around you? Or have you been seeking to serve the Lord? You know, and so he was just mentioning that we need to always keep it in balance. You know, that we're not so busy serving other people or maybe just doing the tasks that need to be done. That we're not engaging in a personal relationship with the Lord and giving him thanks and praising him. And so as Levites, we can remember this, to praise him both morning and evening. Um, I know for myself, I'm trying to build in the evening one. The, the morning one, uh, pretty much for years, I've um, done, done that in the morning. But I do find in the evening, I get home from work, you know, and sometimes you just get kind of busy. You're just sort of like, well, I got this to do and that to do. And before you know it, it's, it the day's over. You know, so I'm trying to really make sure I'm building in a little separate time where I'm like, no, I'm going to spend a little time and thank the Lord. You know, so I just want to encourage you with that. This is a great week to start that with it being Thanksgiving. And so we're going to receive our offerings here in just a moment. We've got a few electronic ways on the screen uh, that you can give. 
These are also in your bulletin, but we'll also receive the offerings and the prayer requests here in the service. And so I'm going to pray over those. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, that just that you want to have a relationship with us. I just think this is kind of an interesting thing, that we can minister to you. You minister to us so much, but we can minister to you through giving you praise and thanksgiving, Lord. And so I just pray that you'd help each one of us just to remember that and to just be intentional about doing that throughout, throughout our entire week, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would use the offerings that are coming in. I pray, Lord, that they would be something that would be honoring and glorifying to you, that you would use them you know, to draw other people into your kingdom and into your family. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the people giving and that you'd also be with all the prayer requests, Lord, and have your perfect will in all of those situations, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Lonnie and Max will receive the offerings and the prayer requests. And while they do that, I have just a few announcements for us. One is Tuesday night we finished our grace study. And so we've got um, a movie that we're going to show. We're going to show God's Not Dead, number two. And so that'll be uh, 5 p.m. We'll start with dinner, and then we will watch the movie. And so that's a very timely movie. It's about a teacher who gets in trouble. She gets asked by a student a question um, about, about the Bible, and then she gets in trouble for answering it. Um, so I just feel like this, this could be in the headlines right now, actually. So, <laughs> so that, that'll be a good one. And then I wanted to mention that uh, we don't have Hop Cafe or the Wednesday Zoom prayer this week. I just figure that Wednesday's a big day to prepare for your Thanksgiving meal, um, especially if you're a mom or something. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, we're going to skip the Wednesday activities. We will have Tuesday, though. And then the next thing I wanted to mention was that next Sunday, we are going to decorate for Christmas in here. And so hey! after the service, yeah, that'll be fun. After the service, we'll have a pizza party. Yeah! And we'll put up the decorations. So that'll be good. And then we've got one more here, I think. Um, we've got our Christmas open house. is December 16th. And um, so it's 6 to 8. But if you want to help us bake cookies, we're going to do some sugar cookies. I've got um, little yeah. little and molds, know, and we'll get decorations. We're going to see some <laughs> old friends of House of Purpose are going to be coming to. Some people are going to surprise you that are going to show up for this Christmas party. So get excited about that and what God is doing. We love the people in our lives, don't we? Nancy got caught up. She got hung up in a wire there. <laughs> She needed some prayer for a minute, didn't she? I want to thank uh, our prayer line has been spectacular. Thank you that have joined our prayer line. But I want to talk to you today about belief. Another in our message, our series on belief, about being moved with compassion. And we're going to explore how Jesus was moved with compassion in this message. But let's start out in the book of Job. In Job chapter 32, verse 1 through 5, Job had some friends, you know, but sometimes his friends weren't really led with compassion. They would share, but I don't think there was a lot of compassion inside at that moment when he most needed it. You know, Job was going through a lot if you read the book of Job. It says, so these three men, they ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And in verse 2 it says, Then the wrath of Elihu, which is the youngest friend, the son of Berkai, the Buzzite, of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. And his, it says his wrath was aroused because, in his opinion, he justified himself rather than God. So initially they came to comfort him, right, in the beginning. But somehow now, wrath is arised in these friends. Against also these three friends, his wrath was aroused. So not only was he angry with Job, now he's angry with the other friends. Um, how many of you have ever been in a situation where friends get angry at each other and it's not a good scene? So this really wasn't a good scene. Say, say not a good scene, man. Because they found no answer. And yet, they condemn Job. How many of you know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus? Amen? Yes. 
That's right. So let's go to verse 4. Now, because they were years older than Elihu, Elihu waited to speak to Job. At least he had some respect. He showed some respect to his other friends. But respect is, is quite different than compassion, isn't it? When Elihu saw there was no one to answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused again. He says, ain't you going to say nothing? Well, I'm going to say something. I'm going to correct this guy. You know, it's not going to have a very, it's not going to be a very compassionate scene. Believe me, I've got something to say to you and you better listen. So this is kind of the confrontation that's set up in here. You know, we don't need friends around us that are going to be aroused and think they got to fix us sometimes, do we? Sometimes we're going through a lot in our lives and we don't need fixing. We might need just a little bit of compassion. Amen? Amen. Yes. So sometimes, though, we can put the shoe on the other foot. We can look at Job's friends, but sometimes we can act that way, too. So point number one is in wrath. Sometimes we even justify ourselves and our position. and use, We can use God's word as ammunition, even, in our self-justification. We can... We can take scripture and say, you know what? I'm going to fix you today, Michael. I see your problem completely in front of me. Uh -oh. And here, here Michael is needing, he says, uh-oh. Michael came in, he says, wait a minute, I was needing some compassion today, all right? Brother, I wasn't looking for that, right? So in, in Matthew 14, 14, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And it says, but he was moved with compassion. Now Jesus knew everything. He knew what was in the hearts of men. He knew that. If somebody was to be aroused in some way, knowing the deep thoughts of people around him, instead, you know what? He's moved with compassion. He sees their situation. And he's moved with compassion. And this word that comes out of compassion is Splotnomia, which is a Greek word. And to be moved with a compassion is a pity. The, the, the uh, Greeks regarded this to mean from the very bowels or depths of one's being. Felt so deep inside, Jesus related. So deep within. And let's go on to the next part. So point number two would be this. We need to be honest with ourselves. And how we are moved towards actions and words, right? What's moving my actions? What's moving my words towards another person? If, you know, sometimes we need to take a minute and think about that. We need to be honest, you know, with ourselves. And what's going on inside of us, deep within us. You know, the Bible tells us it's, it's you know... Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks sometimes. And sometimes we wish we didn't speak and, and wish we didn't have that particular heart condition in that day. But you know, we have an ability to move with the compassion of Christ. It's not within our, na our nature ourselves, but it's something that the Holy Spirit can prompt us to act upon. And you know, Jesus was always full of the Holy Spirit. The Greeks regarded this you know, just to be so deep with inside, a place of tender mercies, a feeling of affection, like I can relate to that, that I have sympathy towards that. You know, I, I want to feel what you're feeling, and, and I think I understand what you're feeling, and maybe help me to understand so that I could relate more deeply. And sometimes we need to operate in a way that we relate more deeper to each other, don't we? Amen. I got one, yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> we're, we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> so, Jesus, he, at least five miracles in Scripture relate to that word dealing with compassion. And one is found in Matthew 14, 13 through 21. When Jesus heard it, he departed there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Jesus is like, I need to be by myself for a minute. I need to get with God for a minute, though. Jesus often went alone to be with the Lord. And he went into a deserted 
place by himself, but it says when the multitudes heard it, oh, they followed him on foot from the cities. They really basically met him wherever he was going sometimes. And it says that he was moved with compassion for them. And what did he do? He healed their sick. Here this Jesus is tired. He needs refreshing himself. But yet he has that sensitivity. He has that prompting from God within him. That he says, you know what? I'm still moved with compassion. And we find it more difficult sometimes when we're tired to operate in compassion, don't we? Yep. If we're honest with ourselves today, right? Mm -hmm. And let's continue on. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, said, this is a deserted place. Remember, Jesus was looking to get by himself. And now the disciples clearly, they need to get by themselves, they need some rest. And the hour is late, they said. You know, it's getting late now, Lord. This has gone on long enough. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the village and that they, they may buy food for themselves. Let them fend for themselves. Notice the lack, the end of my compassion. I'm, I'm, you know, this has been a long day in ministry, okay? And I, I'm exhausted. Let them go feed themselves. They'll be just fine. So, but Jesus said to them, well, they don't need to go away. My compassion's still here. They don't need to go away. He says, you know what? In fact, I want you to feel compassion. I want you to not only feel it, but I want you to experience it. I want you to give them something to eat. I want you to do it. And can you imagine, what, what are we going to give them to eat? So they said, all we have is five loaves and two fish. So they're still operating. You know, hey, send them away still. They've still got that. They've seen Jesus feed people before. They've seen the miracles. They've seen Jesus moved with compassion. And he said, you know what? Guys, bring them to me. Here's another demonstration of trusting God. That the miracles happen when we're moved with compassion. So Jesus demonstrates compassion. He demonstrates the miracles that are moved with compassion. And sometimes, church, we want a miracle. But the compassion can be lacking, can it? And that's something that is key to more miracles in your life is to be moved with the desires of God, to be moved with the compassion of God. And Jesus says, they don't need to go away. Hey, you guys are going to experience compassion. I want you to see it for yourselves, and I want you to feed them. This is the way you should feel about this situation, guys, that you should feed them. And they said to him, you know, we only have this. And he said, bring it to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven he blessed and he broke them and he talked about giving thanks right one of the most important things we can do is give thanks enter into a, a situation where you know what I need to be grateful gratefulness actually leads to compassion yes, yes. in our lives so he blessed him, he broke the loaves, he gave it to the disciples, and he said, and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. And so he wanted them to be a part of this demonstration of compassion. And so those that had eaten were they ate and they were filled, and they took up twelve baskets of fragments that remained. It's like, now we got some extra lunch for ourselves. Situation wasn't so bad, was it, guys? And those who had eaten were 5,000 men besides women and children. Can you imagine the amount of people that were present that day? And when we're moved with compassion, the compassion of Christ, I want to tell you that we 
experience the miracle presence of God. Because what is God? God moves in love. God is love. Yes. Amen? Amen. And he moves in that power and through when we operate in love. Yes. Jesus prayed in John 17 that they would be one yes. even as we are one. Jesus says, I want you to be one, guys, with my compassion today. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see God operate. And if we look at Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were weary. They were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Remember what Jesus did? Jesus operated in the capacity of a shepherd, but with love. He had them sit down in the previous miracle. He had them sit down and he says, you know, it's not so bad. I know it seems like you're hurting cats sometimes. And sometimes it feels that way, and it can feel that way, and you get distracted by all the movement and all the things and all the pieces in life. In Matthew 14, 14, another miracle is happening, and Jesus saw a great multitude, and he was moved with the compassion, and he healed they're sick. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing to see the sick healed? Church, we got to be moved with the compassion. We've got to feel what Jesus feels towards people. Amen? Amen. Verse 18 of Matthew, case in point. Pastor's not making this up. Another move of compassion. The master said to that servant, the master of that servant was moved with compassion, rather, and released them and forgave the debt. Was that a miracle to that person? Yes. That debt was forgiven? Yes. That he owed so much? And folks, we owe so much of our lives through salvation to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How can we help not be being thankful? How can we help not being, and we gotta say, well, you don't know, Pastor, I'm tired today. It's difficult for me to be moved with compassion. God isn't asking you to be moved with compassion of yourself, of your old nature. He's, he's saying, I can move that compassion in your life. If you desire to move in compassion, the Holy Spirit will move powerfully in you. He says that I will give you the words when you come before men. With God, we never end up short. Amen. 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 He speaks to us. He shows us how. He puts situations in front of us that says, here's an opportunity, okay? Not, not, not to be abrasive. An opportunity not to set someone in their place or correct them. But here is an opportunity to operate in my compassion. Would you like to do that? Thank you. Thank you. Then Jesus in Mark 1, 41, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and he touched them and said, and he said to him, I'm willing to be cleansed. This is a man that's a leper. This is a man that's an outcast on society. This is a man that says, you know what? I need healing today, Jesus. I need your compassion in my life today. I really need love today. He's an outcast of society. And Jesus says, the ones that the religious leaders would not touch, he touches. And he moves in an area of compassion where everyone else must have saw it and thought, why is he touching this man? They couldn't feel the compassion deep down inside anymore. No, they became religious in their thinking. They began to use the word as a weapon. 
In fact, they added more rules on top of rules to their thinking. You know, when we become religious in our thinking, what happens is we think everybody else should measure up to the way that we're at, as if we've arrived somewhere. Isn't that true? Instead of saying, I was a person that was a debtor. Instead of saying, I was a leper, okay? I was an outcast. I wasn't all that in a, in a handbasket. I didn't come in the door being everything. No, I need Jesus to be everything in me. Amen. 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 Yes. So Jesus, Mark 6, 34, and Jesus came out and saw a multitude and he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd again. So he began to teach them many things. He began to meet them where they were at. And he began to speak to them. It said that Jesus spoke like no one else ever spoke. He spoke with the power, the authority of God, but yet with a compassion and a tenderness to people without a shepherd. He became the good shepherd. Amen? Seeing people with the mind and the heart of Christ. Man, folks, it stirs us to respond in the miraculous with eternity in mind. You know, many came to Jesus. It said if all the th miracles that he had done, there would not be enough books to contain. Yes. The times he was moved with compassion. Look how many times we just looked at it today. But what about us today? What about us today and how we are moved to action? We need to ask, why, why am I taking this action? Do I feel the situation deep down inside as Jesus would? Would I see it in more than a natural? Would I see it in a supernatural, compassionate way? And Acts 1.8 says, you know, it's like the apostles, right? Jesus breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit. They received the, soul of the, 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 the seal of redemption. They believed in Christ. They believed, they seen the crucifixion. They believed in the resurrection. All of that was there. Okay? But the power of the Holy Spirit in operation in their lives. He says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Oh, then you'll be moved with compassion. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Then you will operate like a good shepherd in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Then you will know Let's jump forward and ask Paul is talking to a group of disciples. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions of Ephesus, finding some disciples, okay? So he comes across some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the power of God to be his witnesses? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is any Holy Spirit. And you know, in the church today, we have got to believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to tell you without it, we cannot operate. Amen. We can, we'll start to operate in a religious way. Say, so, well, God fixed me this way. Let me fix you the same way. And so this question is asked. And, and they said to him, to what were you were baptized? And said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. He says, that's good. Very good. Saying to the people that they believed on him who should come after him, which is Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
They made sure that they were saved. Amen? Get this. We're going to make sure that the situation is right. We're going to make sure that you're entering into eternity. But then Paul does something powerful. Paul lays his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And guess what, folks? They spoke, they spoke in other tongues, and they prophesied. Oh, God forbid. They started operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Dang. wow. That's a good thing. Amen? In 2 Corinthians 13, 13 through 14, Paul tells them too. Oh, and listen to this. There was about 12 men, 12 men in all that day that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Lord talks about this in Scripture. He says, you need to move on to some things that are important. Baptisms are elementary, okay? One, you need to receive Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, folks, this is the way it works. The Holy Spirit draws you in. He baptizes you into Jesus. Amen? Into the family of God. Welcome. Good. Jesus says, now, guess what? You've got to witness. You've got to operate in the power. Amen? You've got to operate in something that's beyond yourself. So Jesus then baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. There's one that's going to come that is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with power. Amen? With fire. He's going to light a fire of compassion in you. Amen? Because then Paul talks about how the gifts of God work in Corinthians, and he talks about that they work by love. Amen. Folks, people can operate in a semblance of strangeness and call it a gift of God. But we need to operate in the gifts of God with love. Amen? Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 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 Let it be with you all. Let it be moved into compassion. Let that you operate in the gifts of the Spirit, discernment, all these other things. Some of the things we need to be most discerning about in the gift of the, the gift of discernment is to discern that we got a problem. Amen. <laughs> it's got to operate in me first. Amen. Or else, what do we do? In wrath, we justify ourselves or our position or use God's word as ammunition for our own self-justification. But we need, folks, we need to be honest with ourselves as to how we're moved to actions or words. Is it a stirring of God deep down inside? A move of the Holy Ghost. See, when we're moved with compassion of Christ, we will experience miracles. You're saying, I want to see more miracles in the church. Church, we got to move with compassion yes. in the church. Amen? Amen? Seeing people in need with the mind and the heart of Christ stirs us to respond in the miraculous with eternity in mind. Amen? Amen? So what actions do I need to take? Glad you asked. <laughs> you got to recognize First in ourselves, self-justification and self-preservation. Those are two things that are very selfish, amen? Mm -hmm. Next, once that work is done, once that repentance has happened, we need to be filled and stirred by the Holy Spirit daily. I want to experience and be filled with your spirit and feel it deep inside that I would love as Jesus loved. Amen. And then we got to watch for the opportunity to exercise compassion in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, give me an opportunity today to exercise compassion. Yes. Amen. How about that? Yes. Is that a great prayer? Yeah. Yes. So we need to respond to that calling. That's to, to see the miraculous. This is a key to revival within the church. 
First revival has to happen in the church. It has to happen deep down inside. Yes. I want to pray with you today. But sometimes we got to change our position. And we got to see it God's way. And we got to operate in the power of God. So if you will stand to your feet today, as Paul would do and Paul would say, you know, I recognize repentance in your life. So let's pray and let's make sure that no one leaves here that isn't entering into eternity first. Just pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Display compassion. Display compassion. Through dying on a cross. Through dying on a cross. For me. For me. For spreading out your hands. For out your hands. So wide. So wide. So compassionately. So compassionately. That I could receive. That I could receive salvation. salvation. I thank you that you rose from the dead. I'm going to live like I believe it. I'm going to live like I believe it. Now let's lift our hands up towards heaven and let's say we want to receive the Holy Spirit. Why is it the Holy Spirit is so, so restricted in the church today? Why? We can't let that happen. Okay. Amen? Amen? So let's receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you can do this daily, folks. God, I need your power. Holy Spirit. Just pray, Holy Spirit, all over this place. Holy Spirit. Oh, take control. Fill me with compassion. Fill me with your power. I want to feel Jesus' heart. I give you my life. Help me to see things in a different way. Overflow me. With your, power, with your power to move in compassion, to move in, in Jesus name, in Jesus amen. Name. amen, amen, all right, good decisions, hallelujah, let's give him a shout, hey, uh, we're going to do something uh, unique right now, remain standing for a minute, because we're going to take communion next, and I'm going to ask uh, one of our elders, Max, to come forward, and uh, get the elements of communion. And we're going to hand those out and we're going to take them together as a symbol of uh, in our communion with Christ's compassion. Amen. is passing them out and as the music plays so sweetly God stir in our midst help us to move with compassion Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 15 through 17 I'm speaking to a wise and sensible people judge carefully Thoughtfully consider it, says in the Amplified, for yourselves what I say. Is the cup of blessing which we bless at the Lord's Supper not sharing in the blood of Christ? Indeed it is. Is the bread which we break not sharing in the body of Christ? Not sharing in His compassion? You might say, since there is one bread, we believers who are many, hey, we're united into one body, not divided. For we all partake of one bread, which represents the body of Christ. Folks, Christ's body was broken so that we could receive our healing. By his stripes we are healed. 
of a former way of doing things, of an insensitive way of living. Is everybody served? Were you able to open it up? Is there's a little foil wrapper you got to pull off of there first. Clear first. Yeah. Clear. So when, when he took the bread, he broke it. He knew what was going to happen. He knew it wasn't going to be a good day. Oh, there's going to be a lot of pain that day. So he broke the bread. So let's break the bread because Jesus was broken for us. Amen. He breaks it and he gives thanks. Can you imagine? He gives thanks. You know, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For you, Stephen, he endured the cross. For each and every one of us, he endured the cross. The joy set before him, the love, the compassion. And he, he says, I do this. He says, you do this. He says, folks, you have this compassion. You do this in remembrance of me. So let's receive the bread today. And then, in the same way, at the supper, there was one that would betray him, right? There was one that would not operate in compassion. There's one that would turn him over. He washed that man's feet. Do you, you know that? He washed Judas' feet. He knew that he was going to do that. And sometimes, folks, we know that people ain't going to respond in the right way, even if we offer them compassion. But we still do. It's something that's supernatural. And so he says, this is a cup. He says, this is a cup of the new covenant. This is a cup of doing things in a new way. This is a cup of compassion. This is a cup of my blood that was poured out to cover your sins, your sins, my sins. He was without sin, cast the first stone. Remember that? They all dropped their stones. We, we, we got no stones to throw anymore, church. So in remembrance of that, let's take the cup. Let's lift it up to heaven. Empty cup. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much. We don't make this commonplace. No, we, we we don't want to live like common people. Oh, we want to live in communion with you, Lord. We want to see it through your eyes. We want to experience your heart. Deep down to the core of us, God, impart your heart to those that we see. Thank you, Lord. Fill this cup with compassion, Lord. Fill this cup. 